Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, discussion roundtable on Tom Shippey's new book, uh, Laughing Shall I Die? I'm Nelson Gehring. Uh, Carl Anderson's here, Paul Peterson as well. And of course, the guest of honor is Tom Shippey, who's uh, taught at a, a number of universities over the years, um, including uh, St. John's College, Oxford, and St. Louis University. Uh, he's, you know, uh, I know many of you will be familiar with his work on uh, Tolkien, of course, The Road to Middle Earth, author of The Century, Roots and Branches. Uh, of course, he's also a, a scholar of, of medieval English, et cetera, uh, and uh, broadly speaking, uh, literature and philology. And uh, yeah, his, his most recent book is on uh, Vikings, um, maybe more strictly speaking than uh, we'll talk about that, I think, at some point uh, here. And uh, it's a it's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Very readable. Uh, it's rich. A page turner, which is not something you often say about an academic book. Uh, and uh, I think that's all the introduction that we really need. I think I'll turn it over to, to Tom to tell us a little bit about how he came to write this book. Well, um, three things, really. One was uh, I was passing through um, Amsterdam Airport and I went over to look at the, uh, the bookshelves and I saw books there which had th titles like um, Roman generals, um, British admirals, uh, patriot chiefs. And they were all the same kind of format. You know, there'd be 10 chapters on kind of the 10 top Roman generals or whoever it might be. And I thought, well, this is easy. Uh, uh, how about doing 10 top Vikings? So that was the first idea I had. It didn't quite work out because sometimes they come in pairs, you know, and I couldn't couldn't figure them out to be quite 10. But that was the, the sort of first idea I had. And the second thing that happened was um, I was talking to um, a very distinguished scholar in the old Norse field whose name I will suppress. Um, I'll tell you tell you later, you guys. Um, and I mentioned Vikings or something. And he said to me, he said, Vikings, he said, I don't like the idea. And I don't like the word either. And I thought, oh, um, well, that's funny because uh, I understand the attitude. Uh, uh, you know, they weren't nice people. But I tell you what, it doesn't stop people putting them in the book titles. So quite often, in fact, almost all the time, you pick up a book with Viking in the title and it changes the subject. The, the lead one, of course, was uh, 40 years ago, Peter Foote's The Viking Achievement. You pick it up and it's got chapters on explorers and traders and urban developers and new Europeans and all that kind of thing. Uh, but Vikings, uh, no. In fact, it's not the Viking achievement at all. It's the Scandinavian achievement. And most Vikings were Scandinavians, but not all of them. But most Scandinavians weren't Vikings. So actually, that's just confusing the subject. And another one, just to mention, I picked it up. It's called Song of the Vikings. It's a biography of Snorri Sturluson. Um, well, he, he never met a Viking. He wasn't a Viking. What, what, what's all this about? So um, I thought, all right, uh, 10 top Vikings, that's one idea. And the other is to have a book which says Vikings in the title, except it isn't, it's in the subtitle, um, but it'll actually be about Vikings. There's a new idea. So that was uh, uh, the other thought I had. And, and a more general thought is this, you know, um, in the modern world, there are, two areas of medieval literature which have what the uh, the marketers would call name recognition and one is vikings and the other is king arthur and actually uh, the specialists don't want to talk about either of them they are in one way or another an embarrassment i remember ronald hutton a uh, professor at bristol he, he said he turned up to a day conference for the general public, which was advertised as uh, King Arthur in the southwest of England. And they had, you know, an archaeologist talking and a historian talking and goodness knows what. But nobody mentioned King Arthur. And at the end, one of the audience, uh, rather puzzled, sort of put his hand up and said, excuse me, we, we came here to hear about King Arthur and, and nobody said anything about him. And, you know, the, the people on the panel, they all looked at each other. Um, okay, who's going to feel this one? This is a hot potato. But uh, Ronald said, uh, he said, you know, this is this is uh, taking money under false pretenses. Going back to Vikings, we know perfectly well that there's a big gap between, you know, the popular image, which is uh, horned helmets and blood eagles and all that kind of thing, and the, uh, the specialist opinion, which is quite different. But actually, just um, 
just just refusing to address the the problem is not the way to go. What I'm saying is a, a big gap has opened up between what the general public wants to know and what people are prepared to tell them. And I thought, well, actually, uh, uh, I, I would like to try to fill that gap. So that that was uh, the these are all, as you notice, slightly uh, slightly indignant reactions or, or counter reactions or whatever um, but that was what uh, uh, got me thinking about it and there, there's one other thing um, as soon as people started rediscovering old Norse literature which took place I guess from the 17th century onwards what struck them was the uh, fascination with scenes of death there's death scenes there's death songs there's famous last stands there's famous last words uh, that's what the literature is kind of about. So I decided to call it Laughing Shall I Die, which is the last line of, uh, of uh, uh, Ragnar, Harry Breach's death song. And uh, the subtitle was uh, Deaths and Lives of the Great Vikings. And the publishers, of course, looked at it and thought, hmm, no, lives go before deaths, don't they? So we change it around and we call it Lives and Deaths of the Great Vikings. But actually, that's a classic example of the facilior lectio. Um, you know, you change uh, the, the author's intention to something that is more recognizable. And so the subtitle now is Lives and Deaths of the Great Vikings. But I was trying to home in on the deaths. Um, couldn't always do it, depending on the nature of the material. But that was, uh, that was what I was looking for first. And if I could just say one other thing, um, one of the great books in this, uh, in this field, I think, was by... Um, Thomas Bettelson, who I think it was 1689, wrote a book called, it has an enormous long title in Latin, so I can't remember all of it, but it was something like um, De Causis Contemptu Mortis Apud Danos Ad Huc Gentiles, On the Causes of the Contempt for Death Among the Still Pagan Danes. And he wrote this enormous uh, uh, book in Latin, which is really a kind of compilation of the big scenes. And I thought, well, uh, um, that was the first reaction. It was an honest reaction, and uh, and I think it was a good reaction actually. And so I uh, I kind of uh, followed in his footsteps. Uh, I, I looked at many of the scenes that he looked at. It's a very rare book. And uh, have you ever, has anybody ever seen a copy? No. Well, you see, I, I've never seen a whole copy. I've just got had photostats of some of it, but. One day I'll be in a Scandinavian university or possibly at uh, Minnesota, which uh, has a really terrific collection of Scandinavian material, as you'd expect. And I'll get to see the whole book. But I think, as I say, that was a, that was a groundbreaker. Walter Scott loved it. Walter Scott was still reading it 150 years later and saying what a good book it was. But of course, Walter Scott was a gentleman and that meant he could read Latin without any trouble. And that's not so common these days. Well, that was that's uh, that was uh, those are the things that got me thinking. Um, now, uh, can I expand on on any of that, or, just, or or go in a different direction? If anyone would like to go in a different direction, Carl. Well, I would like to you? come back and I would like to come back and ask you about some of that, um, but perhaps for the benefit of our our studio audience, <laughs> our internet audience. Um, I was, I was, you know, going to say um, the book itself does kind of, you know, um, capture some greatest hits. It starts off with um, sort of a pre-Viking approach, um, possibly even sometimes a non-Viking approach. But looking at some of the background, you know, you you go through a lot of the the material, and we end up at the end, and uh, we go through from the before the Viking Age through the Viking Age to after the Viking Age, and we look at what was going on in the Viking Age, and we look at how people after the Viking Age were, uh, you know, viewing the Viking Age. But then, you know, it starts off actually with how Vikings, the sort of things that Vikings themselves might have been looking back to, um, doesn't it? Because you, you have your three case studies. You have um, Higelak and, and Hrolf, um, getting our names from both sides of the Old English and Norse divide there. We have, you know, the Volsungs and the Niblungs. And Ragnar and the Ragnarsons, and there's an argument between those three blocks, the the matter of Denmark, the matter of the Nibelungs, and the matter of Ragnar. You've, you've got quite a lot of background to the Viking mindset. 
Um, yes, uh, well, I, I'm glad you said the phrase the Viking mindset, because, you know, that was really something that I uh, uh, tried to harp on. But um, I, I think another thing that I felt uh, liven proceedings up uh, was the archaeology, um, which has actually been quite surprising. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you, you probably noticed uh, uh, I mentioned a couple of mass graves which have been discovered. And uh, one of the funny things is both of them are in one or another very close to me. They found one mass grave of dead Scandinavians uh, in, the, ca in the, the grounds of St. John's College, Oxford. And it was right outside what used to be my office window. So I was looking out at it all the time, but I didn't know it was there. If only. Uh, and then uh, just just uh, a few years ago, when they were digging the relief road for the uh, the sailing events at the London Olympics, um, they found this pile of, uh, well, the first count was 54 skeletons, uh, all of them headless in a pit. And then pretty soon they found 51 heads, 51 skulls close by. You notice more skeletons than skulls. But of course, well, anyway, I drive past this, uh, this, uh, this site every time I go to the dentist. Uh, and actually, I, I figured out straight away, I know what happened to the skulls. It's on a ridge line, and it's where two important roads cross. And if I was organizing a mass execution, um, uh, in terrorem, so to speak, as a deterrent, what I would do is get some poles and I'd stick them in the ground and then I'd stick three heads on them. And, uh, and I bet that's exactly what happened. Well, that's, and that, 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 those, those mass graves are, are, at least they confirm the existence of this kind of mass execution, which we find in legend in the Jomsvikinga saga. And, you know, people have poo pooed this for a long time, but well, uh, I'm not saying events happened the way it says in the saga, but events like that did happen. Uh, so there's no doubt about that. And as for, you know, Carl mentioned um, Higelak and Rolf. Well, the, the strange thing there is that uh, uh, this is about the fall of the House of the Skjoldungs. Um, and uh, this was always said to take place at <clears throat> Hlethraborg, which is the village of Gamla Lyra in, uh, in Denmark. And this too had been poo-pooed quite recently by people like Professor Gwyn Jones, who knows his stuff. But uh, then uh, some annoying Dane walked into Roskilde Museum one day and said, hey, look what I found. And they said, where'd you find it? And he said, Gamla Leira. He said, oh, we'd better go and have a look. So they got their spades and their pickaxes and off they trotted. And of course, uh, they found one thing after another. Uh, last count, and I may be out of date, they had found the, uh, the remains of six uh, Viking halls or pre-Viking halls, um, and they're gigantic. You know, people in Britain boast about the, uh, the hall they found at, uh, at uh, Yeavering up in the north of England and say, oh, look how civilized, you know, we were. Uh, actually, it looks like the Porter's Lodge compared to the ones at Lyra. Um, so, uh, again, uh, the last stand of King, uh, King Hrolfer uh, may not have taken place the way it, uh, it is described in the saga, uh, but there is no doubt that that place was a very major power center and just the case where you might expect to have uh, some major battle or, or disaster. So, I mean, and there are other cases too. The, the archaeology has tended to corroborate uh, what's said in the sagas. Also interesting is uh, our friend Jesse Bayak of UCLA, who has been digging away in Iceland and uh, and really doing excavations on the site of Egil Saga. And he says, uh, you know, the saga seems to him to be dead accurate. Um, you know, of course, that uh, Egil's last act was to uh, hide his chests of silver. Yeah, well, they're still looking for them. And <laughs> I was going to ask. That he knows where they are. But of course, he didn't tell me any further because he knows I'd be out there with a metal detector like a flash thing where I could, I could dig up. But, He'd uh, have to kill you like Egil's slaves. So. Yeah. <laughs> but um, just going back to, to the pre-Viking stuff, uh, one of the things that struck me, because again, I kind of more or less fell over one in the dark one day, literally. I, I, I stubbed my toe on the stone commemorating it. Um, these enormous sort of weapon dumps that they find, of which there are at least six in Denmark, maybe eight, uh, sometimes with boats uh, with them, Newdam, Torsbjerg, 
uh, Hjortspring, and now uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Ilrup. Um, and again, these look uh, like uh, well, these are these are, are all I think pre-Viking, but they suggest that actually Viking activity, you know, seaborne raiding, was endemic in the kind of uh, Baltic area. Uh, so uh, 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 the Vikings, by the time they got round to to raiding further south, they'd had a lot of practice. They'd practiced on each other, and that was very much in their in their background. So yeah, uh, um, I always say uh, uh, there's more in the ground than ever came out of it, and uh, archaeology is very much an open frontier in this area. Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's important to uh, help people catch up with it. I think this is one of the the nice things that comes out of the book. It you know presents all very nicely. You've got the the literary sources and um, the historical sources and how much they do tie in to uh, the archeological sources right through from that pre-Viking period, which Vikings might have been looking back to, on up into medieval Iceland, um, when medieval Icelanders were looking back to Vikings and beyond. Um, and I think, you know, that that's something that doesn't always um, come out in in the research, uh, shall we say, where the focus is, um, I think this is also something that that comes out of your book that there's a, a sort of a disconnect between a lot of what what um, professional researchers or academics are necessarily paying attention to or getting funded for, <laughs> um, and what the popular kind of approach or interest or opinion is, and. Um, that in some ways this is kind of a little bit of a, a, a crisis or a problem for people, um, but on both sides of that divide, the you know the public, and this is something that also comes out in your your Tolkien books as well. I think the public has an interest in these things. They're they're interesting. They're colorful. Um, they tell tell us very strongly and clearly something about ourselves, and I think. That if we look back to what the Vikings themselves were looking back to, or the medieval Icelanders were looking back to, they were looking back to these exciting, colorful things, um, which are kind of downplayed <laughs> um, in a lot of the, say, shall we say, professional research literature that um, gets gets funded um, and graduate students get steered toward. Um, how does, you know, is that something that's changed over time? You mentioned interest in Viking literature going back to the 17th century and coming up to today. And has it always been like that? Um, or has the, the, the focus shifted over time? Well, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think the problem is, is, is pretty obvious. Uh, I mean, you all know that, uh, that uh, you know, Norse Vikinger just means pirate, marauder, robber. And these are obviously not nice people. Um, and uh, in the kind of liberal environment of modern universities, uh, no one wants to show uh, any sympathy for these people. And every now and then I would try and point out that uh, despite whatever good qualities they had, they were slavers. Uh, they were people traffickers. Uh, uh, they were capable of, um, I think, deliberate cruelty uh, as a matter of policy and all that uh, all that is perfectly true um but um obviously this uh, uh is not a popular subject uh nowadays fortunately i don't have to uh, uh teach in universities anymore but uh, they tell me that these days you have to give trigger warnings if you're going to say something which upsets people and a lot of the things of course you know also should do upset people and uh, the reaction to that has been uh, very often to um well, uh, denial, um, uh, we don't believe it, it didn't happen, it must be legendary, uh, there, there's no evidence for it. And the answer to that is, uh, what kind of evidence were you wanting? Um, kind of a, a, a video of the whole thing? Um, uh, a, a dated and signed account? Uh, there's a reason we talk about the Dark Ages, and that's because they were kind of like dark. Um, we don't have much documentation. but. It, in fact, in the old Norse area, we have lots of documentation. It's just that it's not contemporary, or some of it is, but most of it isn't. So you have to sort of, but, but just the same. Um, if you've got a lot of evidence, 
I don't think you should turn your back on it and say, um, uh, well, we don't find this uh, satisfactory. And in any case, we'd rather not. We'd rather not believe it. And there are clear cases of that. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the scene um, where the uh, uh, Arab traveler, uh, Ibn Fadlan, comes upon a party of Rus somewhere in, on the Volga River and a particularly nasty uh, example of uh, female human sacrifice takes place. Well, it's a detailed account by a, a guy who got no reason to lie about it, that people um, can't really say, well, we, don't, we think he must have made it all up. But they uh, like to say instead, well, well, perhaps they weren't really Vikings. Perhaps they weren't really Scandinavians. Or if they were, perhaps they'd sort of... Um, uh, um, um, gone native you know they'd been affected by uh, the Russia. Oh, no, the <laughs> some bloody people anyway, anyway nothing to do with us uh very marked of course in another book which has come out recently and i won't say the name it is written by a swedish author he's not going to admit that his ancestors did horrible things like that no 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 it must have been someone else well that's that's no good i don't think uh, you again you have to uh, <laughs> I, I say you have to face facts, and these may not be facts, but they are uh, very well authenticated and consistent accounts. And uh, as I say, I think you have to stick with them. However, the question was about whether things have changed. Um, and uh, well, possibly, yeah, are, we, are we anomalous? Or are we, you know, are we, are we just you know in a strange moment, um, or has there been a long, a long period of? you know, incremental changes in attitudes towards these things? Because it seemed like from what you were saying that the initial reaction of Western Europeans, let's say, when, you know, Icelandic literature kind of broke out of Iceland yeah. uh, in sort of the 17th and then 18th century, um, it, was a sh it was kind of a shock, but it's a different shock than maybe we have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, yes, I think, you know, we, we've got what you might call the Gothic reaction, where everything was uh, admired, the more, you know, peculiar and, and, and strange it seemed. Um, and uh, uh, it's only natural that there should have been a, a check to that uh, with the professionalization of the subject. Uh, that's fair enough. But I think actually, I think uh, it, it has been loosening up recently. Uh, there have been uh, very good books, one by Neil Price, uh, the uh, uh, it's called the Viking Way. Uh, he's very good on the archaeology, uh, uh, very good indeed. And uh, then there's uh, Eleanor Barraclough's recent book, which is about uh, you know really her travels. Uh, you, you know, uh, I think the striking thing about her, and this is not going to happen to any of us, I don't think, is uh, um, she went up into the north and was was recruited into a society up there uh, where they actually sign you up by knighting you and you're knighted you know taps on the shoulder but they don't do it with a, with a, a sword they do it with the penis bone of a walrus i can see you're looking at me and thinking we didn't know walruses had penis bones that of course nor did i um but uh, uh, her book actually brings out i think how bloody peculiar some of them were um that uh, and neil price says the same thing he thinks that uh, we see them as, as it were, as a European culture, but in some ways they're an Arctic culture. And uh, they had more contact with, uh, we would say, shamanistic cultures than we have quite realized. And again, some of the archaeology is uh, 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 very weird. Um, you know, uh, somebody buried the shaman's outfit in female clothes. Um, so we've got a cross-dressing Viking shaman. Oh, um, and uh, and of course, uh, Eleanor makes a point about necro pants. Do you know what necro pants are? Carl, you're you're laughing as if you do. The Paul, famous Icelandic necro pants. They so get to go and see them at the Icelandic witchcraft museum. Um, yeah, I think. Oh, you see them at the witchcraft Paul museum. Must have seen them. Yeah, they're on display. I mean, at least a pair of necro pants i don't know if there's a whole I'm wearing one. one right now actually <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm on a loop on one can uh, it's for my benefit and anyone else's benefit out there <laughs> they're very hard to remove um you have to take one foot are out you talking about the initial removal or from 
to transfer Ooh. them. <laughs> oh, okay. So, right, so right. my coin purse is filled. Um, I won't explain where the coin purse is, but <laughs> transfer them. It's one leg out, and someone else has to insert into that leg as we transferred the balance, so to speak. Anyway. We're perhaps not being clear on the necropants. The necropants yeah. in the Icelandic Witchcraft Museum are um, pants, or indeed, in British parlance, trousers um, made of human skin. And they were a, uh, a, uh, an item of fashion and, and utility, I suppose, for a particular uh, Icelandic sorcerer um, in, I guess, possibly the late medieval or maybe early modern period, I don't remember. Um, but it's not the sort of thing <laughs> um, that is uh, normally encouraged these days. And, and certainly the sort well, of thing I, that would excite we, the Gothic imagination. <laughs> we might be able to um, excuse the Vikings from the habit of wearing necro pants because we don't know. But uh, I'm just saying that actually uh, uh, very weird things were happening. And there's no doubt that, uh, say, even the Norwegian Vikings and the Icelandic ones were in contact with, uh, with people who are, we would think are culturally quite alien. Um, and they obviously, uh, they obviously interacted to some considerable extent. So yeah, yeah uh, um, I think uh, things have, uh, have uh, uh, lightened up and broadened out in recent years. Um, but, uh, and actually, it, I could also say that uh, there, there have been some uh, good books written about uh, individual sagas which I think is, uh, is overdue. Um, uh, perhaps I could just say that um, the best thing I ever heard anyone say about uh, sagas was said by an undergraduate student of mine at St. Louis. His name was Joseph Jurgil. And uh, I was uh, talking about Laxdala saga, and I was saying that the, the critical event, the killing of Kartan by his cousin Botley, uh, goes back, uh, uh, if you you ask what the immediate cause of it is, well, there's kind of Gudrun being jealous, uh, there's the family um, uh, um, competition going on between the two branches of the family, there's the uh, the sword with a curse on it, which was actually the fault of uh, Thorgerd, the daughter of Edgar Skatlagrimson, a family who are notoriously mean and tight about money, and I was grinding on like this, uh, uh, and uh, Joseph uh, uh, put his hand up and he said, uh, what you're describing is what we in aerospace engineering, because that's what he was studying, aerospace engineering. He said, we in aerospace engineering call an error chain. Uh, when an when a airliner crashes, it's not just one thing. It's a string of things. And usually you can say, well, this could have been averted if someone had done this then, but it was missed. Well, I thought, well, that's a, that's a good description of a family saga. They're uh, kind of error chains and uh, figuring out what the cause of everything is, you know, that's the, uh, that's, that's part of what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, but there, it, it takes someone from aerospace engineering to point this out. I thought, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, we should have thought of that. Anyway, uh, he thought of it and now I've thought of it. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going to get into the literature, I guess. But I think you could take that approach with, uh, with a number of sagas. You know, you know, our friend Andrew Warren, um, the, uh, uh, he, he, he's now retired, but he spends much of his time in Iceland. He um, had a fest shrift. And the, the thing with Scandinavian fest shrifts is you're supposed to write little jokey pieces. So I wrote a little jokey piece looking at uh, Vatnsdala saga, which, uh, which Andrew had translated, and said, um, uh, we've got to get away from our uh, kind of uh, um, uh, male chauvinistic Eurocentric human speciesist thinking, because this is actually a story about trolls, isn't it? <laughs> I put forward my theory that it was really a story about trolls um, and the cultivation of the trollish bloodline. Um, and I tried to do it all in the terms of modern uh, literary theory speak, which I know that Andrew hates like poison. Um, so I thought that was very funny. But as I often happened to these jokes after you've started writing it out you begin to think yeah actually that's not a bad idea um, maybe it's not a joke after all maybe i should take this seriously but um yeah i think uh, uh there's plenty of room for um i think uh, uh more searching analyses of sagas from several directions and and on the whole that has um, not been a popular theme well uh, 
well, it should be, and uh, and uh, there's lots of opportunities there. So, Tom, I wanted to ask you a question about what you have sort of discovered in the process of. I mean, this is this is your entire career here, but what have you sort of discovered about the mi the Viking mindset um, as you were, yeah. you know, exploring the death scenes? I mean, what is the death cult? I mean, the, it's there. There is a, a drive towards death. What what is it that motivates? Uh, the drive towards death among yes. the, the great Vikings in the um, literature. Well, um, here's a, a thought. Uh, um, well, one thing about the mindset actually is, you know, you, you can't get away from the fact it has a, it has a mean streak. Um, it's not just cruel, you know, it's kind of cruel and funny. Um, and uh, we all know that, uh, that uh, one of the things you can say in any discussion is to pull yourself together and say, I don't think that's funny. And then, of course, you're not allowed to, the other guy's not allowed to go any further. But, okay, there's, there's a mean streak, and it's cruel, and it's funny. But I think that, um, thinking about the death stuff, it, it struck me that they have a different attitude to losers. Because you might say that their whole myth structure is based on losing. You know, at Ragnarok, the uh, the... the forces of the gods and the humans will march out and fight their monsters and the giants and they're going to lose and that's a big difference Ragnarok is not like Armageddon uh, where the, uh, the the forces of good will triumph it's exactly the opposite funny that um, and uh, then of course uh, you, if you look at the, the hero stories they're often defined by the moment of death Gunnar in the snake pit uh, Ragnar in the snake pit uh, uh, Olaf, uh, uh, the Olaf, Olaf dying at Svold, Olaf dying at Stiklastad, there, Harold Hardraithi dying at Stamford Bridge. All these are kind of big scenes, and there, there are plenty more like that. Um, so uh, I think that, uh, their idea is, you know, it's it's when you've lost that you show what you're made of. But we don't see it like that. And I think the difference is um, uh, something like a century and a half of competitive games, you know, winners and losers. Well, you know, you play any any of our games now, uh, whatever it is, soccer, American football, uh, hockey, it doesn't matter. Uh, same number on each side, flat pitch, uh, no advantage of ground. In case there is an advantage of ground, you change ends at half time. In case there is an advantage of ground, you toss up at the start to see who gets choice of you know, first, first, uh, first uh, uh, direction to play. Um, <clears throat> everything's fair, um, and it's and, and of course you've also got referees and officials watching. Um, so everything's fair, and if you lose, um, well, you know, you lost fair and square. But that's very unrealistic, isn't it? Uh, uh, I'm sure Vikings thought, well, uh, uh, in our world, um, heroes may be outnumbered; uh, they may be betrayed. They may be taken by surprise or their luck may run out. You know, we don't know who the Valkyries are going to choose in a battle. Uh, the Valkyries decide who they're going to choose and we don't know what they're going to do. So actually, um, uh, it is not a disgrace to lose. Everybody loses sometime. Um, the question is how you take it. And I think that uh, um, I think that was a kind of resource for them. Uh, I think it made them uh, psychologically better prepared for real world events. Um, they weren't brought up on Hollywood movies where you know the uh, the good side always triumphs in the end through some stroke of luck or something. So um, if they uh, if they got beat and they they quite often did, um, it uh, didn't um, it didn't make them sort of reevaluate themselves. Uh, uh, it, it often strikes me, you know, the Vikings got beaten quite often. But then they just come back again. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Egil Skatlagrimson is uh, is there, and he's put down as uh, as winning the great battle of Brunnenburg. And uh, English historians take the Anglo-Saxon chronicle account, which says, you know, great victory. We really wiped the floor with them. Um, you know, that was it for a time. And you think, yeah, okay. Obviously, the Anglo-Saxons had a good day. Yeah, Vikings came back four years later, and and when they came back, they got what they wanted which was the uh, control of the English North Midlands. So you could beat them all right, but, um, but it, <laughs> didn't seem to, it didn't seem to upset them too much. Um, I always thought, you know, 
and this is a, this is a good question. What's in it for them? Um, uh, what are the rewards? Uh, would I sign up for a Viking army? Um, well, what? Going great distances in an open boat, um, terrible food, hand-to-hand um, 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 -hand conflict at the end of it. Uh, so uh, what made them do it? Um, and partly, I think, it's this kind of uh, heroic ethos. Uh, that's what uh, gets you fame and glory. But I must say, I also started thinking about money. Um, again, you know, we don't have any accounts. We don't have any invoices, but we, we do have actually accounts of uh, how much money was paid out in uh, uh, not, not just in Anglo-Saxon England either. Uh, and um, well, I, I, I sort of did some back of the envelope calculations and, uh, you know, I figured out that uh, if you were a kind of um, ordinary ranker, um, say in the 991 campaign in England, you'd probably go home with a thousand silver pennies. That's a lot of now, silver. If you're a kind of younger son. Uh, sorry? That's a lot of uh, four silver. Four pounds of silver. Yeah. 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 Uh, you're a younger son on some miserable one horse thorpe in, uh, in central Jutland. Well, what could you buy with a thousand silver pennies? Quite a lot, actually. Um, I Most think it would set you up for life. Yeah. And the other thing that struck me and uh, struck me very hard was the, was the markup on slaves. Um, we got some figures there, you know, uh, in Laxdale Saga, it sort of says that uh, uh, um, the, the price of a slave girl is about, um, what was it now? Um, about a pound of silver. Same slave girl in Baghdad uh, will get you two pounds of gold. Now the markup, the difference, the, the gold silver ratio now is 75 to one. We don't know what it was then. I don't suppose it was 75 to one, but even if it was kind of 15 to one, you know, the markup uh, uh, between uh, Sweden and Baghdad is like 3000%. And well, you to tell the truth, this, this is like cocaine. Um, uh, uh, and you can quite see why, well, why you know, these people are, are, um, are, are doing what they're doing. It was immensely profitable in an area where there wasn't much else to make a profit from. <laughs> so um, these base and materialistic calculations, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, at least just like to think about them. Uh, and there are, other, there are other conclusions you could come to there. I mean, I think we also forget that uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Western Europe was dirt poor. It had a complete collapse of living standards, which the archaeology has shown. That's another reason why we call them the Dark Ages. Um, things got much worse over most of Western Europe. And uh, uh, how are you going to um, how are you going to uh, turn that round? How are you going to, as we say now, is kick start the economy? Uh, well, um, you're not going to get very far, kind of um, selling, you know, cattle hides or starting a market in salt beef. Um, uh, that's not going to do it. It was the furs and the slaves, which I think revitalized much of uh, much. Well, certainly the northern economy. Um, <coughs> so uh, all these are, uh, as I say, rather, um, rather cruel calculations. Um, but uh, uh, I think one thing we can say about the mindset is they were pretty hard headed. Um, and uh, and that's the kind of thing that was animating them. Um, and again, we have some archaeology for that. You know, the the, the statistics of uh, silver turned up on the island of Gotland, oh, uh, you know, off, off the Swedish coast. They're quite breathtaking, and that's that's what people buried and didn't come back to recover. Most of the time, I you have, bury a hoard, you you come back have, and get it. These are I the ones that got lost. Here. You had the island, you say, oh. Gotland, off in the Baltic Sea, had uh, 1,500 medieval farmsteads, more or less. And there were more than 700 hordes of silver coins, um, the largest of which was, uh, you know, uh, 67 kilograms, or as you say, more than 100 slave girls, um, yeah. or thereabouts. <laughs> and of these are 1,500 farmsteads on the island. And... 700 hordes. So as you point out, over some 10 generations, not only had 
half of the farmsteads more or less buried a hoard, but had forgotten about it. <laughs> um, this doesn't and, count. And the one could I just add one thing? Those are the uh, those are the uh, discoveries which have been re registered and recorded, but uh, both in Scandinavia and in England, uh, I think there's quite good evidence that um, uh, people have quite often found hoards and thought, huh, if I tell anyone about this, I'm going to have to pay tax on this. I know what I'll do. I'll melt it all down. Um, and uh, uh, Sam Newton. Uh, you know, the archaeologist in Suffolk, he says he has very strong suspicions about a number of cases where uh, somebody was digging a foundation for a new windmill or something, which is very often on a mound. And uh, then suddenly they stop building, bin, building the windmill and become very rich and go away very quickly. Um, he thinks, yeah, somebody found something. So, uh, yes, the amount of uh, money that, uh, that were brought back are, are incalculable. Um, but even what we know about is really quite staggering. So this is so, part uh, of yeah, sorry, know, yeah, yeah. fueling. Oh, sorry, I was going to say. So that's one part of what's you know fueling this. You're in a, you're you know you're a second son, as you say, from a relatively depressed corner of a relatively depressed continent, um, and you have the opportunity for fantastic wealth, which you might get killed trying to get. But on the other hand, you might get fantastically wealthy. Um, and then the other, the other part perhaps is, um, you know, related to this idea that you mentioned earlier, and I'll steal one of your other phrases, um, all the, every hero kind of for literary purposes is fighting the long defeat. You can't really be a hero who dies comfortably of old age, um, you know, surrounded by your, your grandchildren and cats. Um, you have to go out in a blaze of glory. Um, that's what makes a memorable hero. And so you've got everybody, like you say, thinking, well, you know, if we don't die on this run, <laughs> we might die on the next, um, but we'll die incredibly wealthy and we'll, you know, we'll certainly make such an end as would be worth a song. And, you know, clearly they're right because they're in your book. Um, <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, that, that, that's, uh, that's kind of hard for us to evaluate, really. And uh, it does go back to the, the Valhalla idea. You know, that was what uh, old Bertelsen said. He said that the cause of the contempt for death among the still pagan Danes was the belief that they would uh, go to Valhalla if they died sword in hand. Uh, Snorri says um, uh, something like, um, those who fall in battle are Odin's adopted sons. So... But then, of course, we also know that um, there was no kind of uh, monolithic Old Norse religion. We don't know what their practices were. We don't know what their, their beliefs were. Um, if you were dedicated to Thor, say, or Frey, uh, did you have to die sword in hand? I don't know. That's all. Uh, that's all uncertain. But just oh, the same, the, uh, um... the the urge <laughs> for fame, I think, is, is certainly part of the, the mindset. Um, uh, Paul, uh, I wonder whether I really answered your question there. Um, but Paul, I don't think we can hear you. Do you have your oh, microphone? Sure. Oh, sure. You're sorry, yeah. I had it yeah. muted. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you have basically answered what I was asking. But um, one of the things I found more interesting is sort of the sanitization that we've done. So you did touch on this a bit earlier, how we've sanitized Old Norse or Viking Age studies, just as a general field, um, from the history to the literature. Um, I do know which sw Swedish author you're referring to, um, and and it's true. We've tried to co-opt the term Viking and and misapply it to just medieval Scandinavian, so we could talk about their economic development and the establishment of cities and trade. But Vikings are exactly as you say, not not the nice guys usually. Um, mm. this, this sort of misunderstanding. So that was one one point that I found absolutely uh, well told throughout the book. Um, so that's that's a you know the greatest praise that I can give is especially I think you you answered my questions in the book extremely well. Um, so one of the other things that you mentioned Neil Price and the sort of development of of kind of modern archaeology, the bloodiness, the gore. Of our of our death cults, um, not even just the Viking drive to go off and and die in battle, but 
the sacrifices, the uh, the 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 killing of of horses um, at at rituals. So this understanding of this different religion or forms of that religion. Um, those are the types of things that I think are, are deeply interesting. And yet we have sanitized it. I mean, wh why do you think it, it is? Is it just because we're modern and we don't like to admit this? So um, especially the modern Scandinavians, right? Known for being very progressive and tolerant and equality and all of these things. Idealistic, yes. Um, but their ancestors were terribly uh, violent. Um, slave traders, as you mentioned, all of these different things about uh, Viking Age society or really even Germanic society going all the way back, um, mm -hmm. the development of Germanic culture. So, um, you know, what what were the things that you had in the book also a bit about Dorset, I think it was, uh, some of the finds with uh, Ivar or Ragnar, um, the new graves, uh, the, the new archaeology stuff. I mean, could you talk a bit more about that and sort of what you found fascinating along the way of kind of diving into the archaeological record? Yes. Well, um, uh, 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 one, of, one of the things that, that, uh, that uh, struck me, just before I get to the archaeology bit, one of the things that, that struck me was to say the kind of um, the humor, um, which is very pervasive. Uh, the kind of uh, jokes and one that go on, of which the most uh, uh, dramatic is um, the the Jomsviking scene. You know, the, uh, after the battle against the against the Jarl Hawkon, um, uh, they line up seventy Jomsvikings who've been captured. You know, uh, uh, suffering from hypothermia and exhaustion, and they they just kind of cut all their heads off as they did at the Ridgeway massacre, um, and. Uh, uh, they all come out with one-liners of one sort or another. You know, one of them says, I don't want to be cut down from behind. You've got to cut me down from in front and just look and see if I flinch. Of course, some of the guys at the Ridgeway Massacre were cut down from behind, which must be quite difficult, actually. If I was going to cut people's heads off, I wouldn't do it that way. But but they did. And then there's a the guy who says, well, I don't mind having my head cut off They're all in the game, but I don't want to get my hair bloody. Do you think someone could... Um, pull my hair back uh, over my head uh, so that the, we'll get blood on it and then you'll have a, a fair shot at the neck and the guy somebody pulls his hair over his head guy lines up with the axe and as the axe is coming down the the guy being beheaded jerks his head back and the axe cuts the hands off of the assistant and uh, of course this is regarded by all all spectators as so damn funny oh really so damn funny to say hey that was that was a good one let that guy off that's good and the, the joke unravels from from there on but that kind of uh, sort of uh, vicious humor uh, seems to be uh, uh, present and as i say our our Ridgeway massacre site and by the way the skull of saint magnus of orkney which they think they've discovered he too said you know he was an aristocratic person he said he wasn't going to be cut down like a thief uh, no, he'd stand stand there and they just have to cut him down from in front. And they did. They found his skull. He got a cleft in it there. Um, so uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, comic stuff is, uh, well, uh, semi-comic stuff is sort of endemic. But some of the archaeology, you know, we've got no idea what's going on. And the obvious example is the tomb they found at Repton, which ha it has been suggested and not by me is the tomb of Ivor the Boneless the son of Ragnar Harry Bridges but uh, basically uh, they found a, a, a skeleton in a stone sarcophagus and racked round it there are about 200 more skeletons many of them as the excavator said uh, men who were massively robust in fact one of the excavators said he, he thought he was excavating creating a cemetery of the Brigade of Guards, which, you know, doesn't take anybody under six foot three or something like that. Um, what the, you know, what, what were these battle casualties? No, they didn't appear to be. Were they Vikings? Were, were they people from the Mercian Royal Cemetery, which was close by? Um, uh, well, we, we don't know. But, in so, but all you can say is that uh, somebody laid out a Viking leader and put 200 bodies around him for some reason. But but it is a kind of, a, uh, what should we say, a, 
uh, uh, um, it's like the things they find in Mesopotamia, you know, a royal burial with hundreds of royal servants around them. Um, and it must be some kind of uh, honorific display. Surely it's that. Though quite what the, what the circumstances were, we don't know. Um, but the connection with um, Vikings is, is very strong. Um, you know, they also found a guy there who um, had a, a Thor's hammer around his neck. Well, okay, that's a Viking. Uh, and uh, it made me realize um, what a nasty business uh, this kind of hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting was. He'd, um, he'd had a slash across the top of his thighs, if you can imagine it, which had gone so deep, it must have emasculated him. In other words, he pretty nearly cut in half, but he'd also been stabbed in the eye and someone had disemboweled him, just to make sure, I presume. Um, but uh, uh, that's the kind of, uh, that's the other side of going home with a thousand silver pennies, I guess. Um, uh, uh, risk reward, uh, there's a kind of uh, uh, cost benefit ratio, as they would say nowadays, <clears throat> and probably not one that we'd volunteer for, but then we're not in there. <clears throat> uh, we have more opportunities than they did. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, there is there is something uh, uh, there is something uh, fierce and bloody about it, and there's no getting away from that. One of my Danish chums uh, said uh, he, he thought, and again, he's Danish. And he said, "Well, it's not just not just us, you know. The the whole of Western Europe was like that. They were all awful." Um, and I thought, "Well, I suppose that's probably correct. Yes, yes. We, we, won't, we won't argue too much about that." Um, but he also said that um, we in Scandinavia don't like to, uh, to, to look at this thing too much anymore, um, obviously because of the general liberal tendency of Scandinavian society. But also he said, and this surprised me, you see, we think that all this stuff about, about the heroic ethos is very upper class. And actually that's not popular in a democratic society. And I thought, well, Frankly, that's that's just dumb. Um, I don't think everybody in a Viking army was a, a, a Jarl or a noble. Uh, they obviously recruited from anywhere. Um, and of course, uh, um, that is even truer in the 20th century, whereas most of the people who've been uh, required to do heroic deeds have come from, uh, you know, um, um, what should we say? Um, at best, the middle levels of society and very often the lower levels of society they're the ones who get drafted so uh, i thought uh, that was just uh, that was that was a kind of misunderstanding on our part actually um and uh, uh we've also learned a lot actually about cruelty uh you know in my lifetime um one thing uh, uh I, I learned and this is partly personal experience is um you want to commit ethnic cleansing uh, you don't have to kill everybody. You just have to frighten them enough that they move, because that's what happened in Yugoslavia. And you know, I was there when it when it all started off. Actually, when it all kicked off, you just got to sort of frighten people, and they will move themselves across the border. And I think that was part of Viking policy too. Um, uh, if you carry out sufficient acts of what we would call schrecklichkeit, you know. Uh, 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 deliberate cruelty, terrorism, you, um, you, you, you scare people off. And uh, the people who want to scare off <clears throat> are not the taxpayers. What you want to do is get rid of the, the, the kings and the nobles. And uh, again, this is, a <clears throat> this is a, uh, as it were, information from local sources. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, that the great army uh, killed the kings of Northumbria and they killed King Edmund of East Anglia. And a book I've just been reading says, uh, uh, that after Edmund died, no one attempted to take the throne of East Anglia because there was no claimant. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. Edmund had a brother, St. Edwold, and he actually didn't try to take the throne of East Anglia. He went as far away from East Anglia as you can get in England without falling into the sea, and he became a hermit down the road from me in West Dorset. Uh, so he wasn't a king, he was a hermit, and he wasn't in East Anglia, he was in West Dorset because he didn't want to see any Vikings anymore. <coughs> and uh, I think that uh, there's also the case of the, uh, the king of Mercia, Burkred, who basically ran away. 
he hopped it and went to Rome, no doubt taking the crown jewels with him and lived out his life in peaceful retirement. But surely that was deliberate. The Vikings didn't want to uh, uh, um, wipe out the English population. They wanted to install themselves at the top level and say, OK, we're in charge now. Your taxes will be paid here. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think, actually, uh, English historians hate to admit this, hate to admit this. Uh, but um, I think a lot of uh, English taxpayers said something like, um, OK, we, we're paying you the rent, boss. Um, do we got to pay tithes to the church anymore? And they said, church, church, what's that? Um, and they, I can see a lot of Yorkshire farmers thinking, OK, that's 10 percent in my pocket. Uh, um, I think there was a lot of. Um, what is now called um, 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 uh, interactive cooperation uh, between uh, Vikings and uh, what ought to have been their victims. Um, there were a lot of there were a lot of deals done, um, and uh, and of course I said at the start that uh, most Vikings were Scandinavians, but actually we found out that actually a lot, a lot of them towards the end weren't. Um, There'd been a, a big study of uh, place names in Normandy, which was settled by the followers of, of what the Viking series called Rollo, uh, 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 Gungu Rover. Um, but the study shows that actually quite a lot of them had Anglo-Saxon names, um, like Athelstan or Dunstan or whatever. Um, and uh, I, I thought actually, you know, if we could go back in time, as you do in science fiction so often, and find some bearded ruffian from a 10th century viking army and say uh, now listen we want you to tell the truth and see if you tell the truth i will give you this bottle of whiskey yes now first question what's your name and he says ragnar and you say oh no whiskey for you come on what's the truth and then he says well it's ragnar now of course but 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 i was baptized edward you won't tell anyone, will you? And then you give him the whiskey and then you can ask some more questions. But I think there was a lot of um, assimilation. I know that was a word I'd got to find. There was a lot of assimilation and a lot of apostasy, um, which doesn't fit the kind of English national narrative of uh, increasing unity, uh, Christianization, cooperation, all that kind of thing. Uh, but I think that... Uh, 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 the Vikings, after all, were not all that different from the people they were raiding. Uh, and that, of course, does raise the question of um, uh, what gave them their edge? What, uh, what, meant, they, what meant that they, they, they usually won the, the, the battles and the contests? And that's a, that's a good question, too. Um, and... Uh, uh, well, I would say, again, this is using deliberately anachronistic vocabulary, but I think they had very good, it's what the soldiers now call unit cohesion. Um, they stuck together. Um, whereas I think uh, an Anglo-Saxon army uh, you know, had a lot of uh, unwilling conscripts in it. Um, uh, and I always thought that, uh, uh, why did we lose the Battle of Hastings? To the French, for goodness sake, it's just not natural. Um, and I thought, well, I, I bet that by that time, uh, everyone was fed up with the government, just like they are now. And um, all over England, there'd been contingents marching towards Hastings, but very slowly. And every night, some people would sneak off and there'd be a little, lot, lot of muttering, you know, well, we've, we've been told to fight this William the Bastard. Is it any, any worse than our bastards? Why aren't we fighting for the Godwinsons, for God's sake? What has the government ever done for us? And, you know, it turns into a bit of a Monty Python scene at this point. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that uh, the, the, the Vikings had, uh, had cohesion in a way that uh, Frankish and Anglo-Saxon armies probably didn't. Um, uh, after all, they were all volunteers. And uh, the armies that were opposing them probably weren't volunteers. And uh, that means it's uh, professionals against amateurs, in a way. That was probably what, uh, what uh, gave them their edge, um, uh, better morale. Um, so all these things can, I think, be, uh, uh, well, 
I, I have a correspondent over in Minnesota who's a, a U.S. Navy captain, surgeon captain, who did a lot of service in Iraq. And he, he wrote a book called Beowulf in Iraq. I thought, oh, Beowulf never was in Iraq, was he? Uh, but what he's saying is he thinks that, uh, that basically ancient literature has uh, lessons that we can learn which are applicable to modern circumstances. And uh, I think, you know, I'm doing it the other way around, actually. I'm using the modern circumstances to try and explain the ancient literature. But there's certainly more connection than, than has generally been, uh, been noticed. Yeah, so um, I guess the other thing I, I really uh, ought to say, and you know it as well as I do, which is that uh, the, uh, the literary remains we're looking at, they, they're really high quality. I mean, there are no better medieval narratives than the sagas. And I don't think that there are any better uh, poems than the Eddic poems. I, th I said I thought the Codex Regis was the greatest collection of poetry in the world. Um, and, uh, and I can't think of anything that, that, uh, that really makes me change my mind about that. Uh, there is a, an uh, immense literary skill there. Um, and we, in a way, we don't know where it came from. Um, we don't know anything much uh, about the background of it, but uh, suddenly it sort of uh, it pops up. Much of it in Iceland. Did they have nothing else to do? It's a long nights, is it? Uh, lots of sheepskins to write on, uh, something like that. that. Necro pants. Um. <laughs> something has just popped up on my screen. I don't know what that that means. Uh, Carl's uh, uh, Paul has vanished. Um, Paul vanished. Yeah, I've managed to. Oh, no, I've, we've yeah. gone an hour here, so I don't know if he's had to to go to another yeah. uh, command. Oh, I was afraid a troll might okay. have gotten. Does that, that mean we've got to stop then? Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to carry on for a little bit longer if people uh, people are interested or if, uh, if we're happy with an hour. Uh, either way. Oh, Paul was just saying, yeah, he's got a he's got a class. He's got an old Norse oh. class. So. Okay. Well, that's a good excuse um, under the circumstances. Um, yeah. um, Nelson, did we have did we have um, you know questions from from our studio internet audience? Um, I was gonna, actually going to say that there are a few coming in here. Um, one comment from earlier, not a question, but one comment from earlier that might be a sort of a, a, little, a little cultural uh, broader cultural horizons here is. Um, uh, Demay Binkley is mentioning that Alaskans know all about walrus penis bones. They are called usics, but I have a couple in my attic. So uh, I guess how strange they are depends on where you're coming from. <laughs> um, and Timothy Fisher is asking, uh, how does the, I think we talked about this a little bit, but I think there's maybe more to say. How does the Valhalla destiny in the afterlife affect the, uh, the loser defiance ethic? Uh, I'm not sure I quite, uh, why doesn't it dilute the eth ethic? I'm not sure I quite Can understand. Can you say that again, Nelson? Um, how does the Valhalla destiny in the afterlife affect the loser defiance ethic? Why doesn't it dilute the ethic? Uh, well, um, uh, we, we've got a very, uh, a striking description of Valhalla from from Snorri, um, which uh, um, which is to some extent confirmed, I think, by poems like uh, Eric's Maul, which was about the the death of Eric Bloodaxe. Um, but I I always wonder actually. Uh, um, it says that uh, you know Odin's adopted sons go to Valhalla, but uh, what about um, people who actually dedicate themselves to Thor or to Frey or to Heimdall or or indeed, and we've got. Uh, 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 th there's a, a, a piece of material found in one of those weapon dumps, which says, uh, I am the servant of Ullr, Ullr, the god of skiing. Oh, okay, well, what happens if you dedicate yourself to the god of skiing and then you die? Well, I suppose you go to a ski resort, um, not Valhalla at all. We, we just don't, we don't Sounds know right. what they thought. But, but yeah, I, yeah. I think that the Valhalla it was pretty, pretty restricted, actually. That was uh, that was for some people only, and uh, one of the sad death songs uh, is um, Egil Skatlagrimson's Sonatorak, which is about the death of his sons, 
And Egil is apparently an Odinic hero, and he's the poem is full of references to Odin, but it's clear he's not going to Valhalla because he's dying in his bed. He's dying of old age. And the last words of his uh, song are, uh, he says that, uh, I will unafraid wait for hell. And hell, he means H-E-L. That is the, um, the gloomy underworld. And that is what he thinks he will be condemned to. But just the same, that's sort of all in the game. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. I think they probably had very different beliefs about the afterworld. Uh, and uh, they probably, they were never a kind of organized religion with one, uh, one single opinion. Um, there are all kinds of uh, separate and weird beliefs. You know, there's the one in one of the sagas where the, the guy thinks that he and his relatives are going to go into the mountain after they die and become sort of mountain people. Well, OK. Um, uh, and there are other opinions uh, uh, floating around as well, not, not all of which have died out, actually. Um, the kind of superstitions last, uh, last a, a long time. Um, so I think that uh, one shouldn't uh, take Snorri and Valhalla as a kind of all-purpose explanation. It's one possibility, but there, there must certainly have been others. And incidentally, I think that, uh, I think that Tolkien worried about this. He never quite got his ideas straight about what happens, you know, uh, in the uh, in the underworld. But but you know about that, Nelson, because you're Mandos, aren't you? <laughs> that's your that's your that's your secret <laughs> in Tolkien circles, the judge of the underworld. And the, so you're uh, you the Mandos. About about that. Okay, well, yeah. yeah. You had, you had mentioned the uh, the scholar, was it Bertelsen, who thought, well, you've got all these Vikings because everybody believes they'll go to Hala, Valhalla when you die. And I almost wonder, you know, whether it's the other way around. You have this, you know, laughing shall I die mindset, the, the death cult, as um, you mentioned, and, and as Paul was asking about. And that perhaps, you know, is part of what generates this idea of, of Valhalla. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting that, I mean, Valhalla, it's off, I don't know what if either of you have opinions on its etymology, but it's often suggested that actually originally was not Val slain hall, but actually originally uh, 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 Valch, Walch, the hall of the, the, the Walchs, the southern people, the Romans, basically, you know, these yeah, uh, yeah. fancy elaborate halls, and then only sort of later got to this sort of actually earthly idea of a Valhalla get mythologized into into an afterlife mm. well it's interesting so, you mentioned that actually you get the whole i mean this is one of the things that goes into the archaeology you get the whole culture and there's some earlier halls like it you know Gudmer or whatever um but halls really seem to take off and they become the kinds of things that you know tom mentions about lyra um around the same time that you get you know big basilica christian churches taking off or, you know, they come just after. So it's almost like, you know, the chiefly hall, which is, you know, some people have argued there's a big change in cult. The focus was on, you know, wetlands and throwing things into bogs, which Tom has also mentioned. And then you shift to, well, now it's the hall of the local big man. Um, and do you, you know, there's, you know, Valhalla, I mean, there's, there's a philological argument, I think, here, too, the different words for hall and when they are used and when they appear and so forth and so on. Um, but it, it seems, you know, not entirely unaccidental that you get, you know, I think, I think Scandinavians were aware of trends that were happening way down south um, and were doing their own thing. Oh, you know, you've got these big halls. Um, we can have big halls. Um, let's let's do stuff in the hall, <laughs> and you know maybe it is like you say the southern the southern hall. So I'm thinking in particular of Atlakida, where they're they start out drinking vin i where you know they're clearly alive. They haven't died. They're going to die, yeah. but they haven't died yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, but yeah. they're, they're, and they're, they're drinking the wine too in in yeah. that yeah. hall, yeah. Um, which would definitely also be associated well, with the same. We're getting, yeah. <laughs> we're going down a rabbit hole there, but sorry. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, I, I, one thing I'd say is I think the the, uh, the anthropologists uh, would call some of this stimulus diffusion. Uh, a good example is the development of runes. Uh, 
when did somebody get the idea of writing runes? Well, obviously, they had seen uh, alphabetic writing, uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in the Roman Empire, possibly earlier than that in North Italy. Uh, but they didn't just copy the letters. They copied some of them. But actually, they adapted the whole thing. But what they got was the idea, uh, the idea of an, of an alphabetic script. Um, and in the same way, I mean, uh, I'm sure that there was a lot of military stimulus diffusion. Uh, uh, they had come across, they'd heard about, they'd possibly seen kind of disciplined Roman armies. And I always think it's quite interesting that uh, some of the earliest uh, loan words into English are quite clearly military words. I think some of those people up there beyond the Roman Empire borders actually went down south, signed on as mercenaries, did their term in a legion, uh, and uh, then went home with their pay and became big shots. Um, and they brought words with them, like uh, uh, like like wine, for instance, is an early early borrowing, and uh, um, also less reputable words. But cheese was another one they borrowed, and so is of course the word manga, which comes from I think Latin mango, which is a, a kind of small corner shop. Uh, that was the kind of people they came into contact with, um, and I think actually there's also the early English word frumgar champion first spear which actually of course the 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 uh the, the top nco in a roman legion was primus pilus first spear and i think uh i think uh, uh anglian mercenaries probably never spoke to a commissioned officer uh but they knew very well who the top nco was they knew who the sergeant major was uh and they borrowed that word for themselves so i think there are no doubt scandinavians who were affected as well the the the, the knowledge got out um it once you've got the idea some of this stuff isn't too difficult and uh, this this goes also to technologies like rowing the hjort spring boat is a paddle boat a canoe um but then they you know you can soon figure out how 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 oars work uh, the knee dam boat you know it's got rowlocks it's uh, it's definitely a rower and then sails that's not too difficult either actually sailing is damn difficult but the general General idea is quite easy. Uh, I think they 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 latched onto that too. Um, so that sort of uh, that sort of effect is what often happens on the borders of big empires. Uh, the kind of uh, message gets across, and people start imitating it uh, the best way they can uh, and adapting it, of course, to their own circumstances. Um, and uh, the halls are a, a really kind of a, uh, an interesting um, development. Uh, there's a book by uh, uh, another Scandinavian, a Swedish archaeologist called Martin Rundqvist, uh, and it's called um, Mead Halls of Eastern Gothland. Um, and uh, yeah, that's an interesting study. Uh, he thinks, uh, he thinks uh, there was a big change of power up there in the sort of Beowulfian era, uh, which, of course, is more or less what Beowulf says, actually. Um, so there are these kind of uh, events taking place, which uh, had a kind of knock-on effect, um, and we we just get the kind of echoes of them. But uh, but they're clearly uh, they clearly you know um, made a big difference to uh, to the the civilization and the culture. We've got a couple more questions coming in. If, our, uh, yeah. if we still have time, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Andy Higgins has uh, has a couple of questions. First, well, he says he's really enjoyed the book. Um, and he wants to wants, he wants to know if you can comment on how the uh, Viking mindset is reflected in current TV adaptations, like the Vikings and the Last Warrior and things like that. Which you mentioned several times. Well, yes, yeah, it comes up in the book. Oh, <laughs> uh, Andy Higgins. Yeah. Um, so, that's it. Well, uh, the first thing I thought about the Viking series was, uh, in a way, that it had been Americanized. Um, you know, the, the the first episode, there's a guy saying, hey, I don't want to sail to the east anymore, I want to sail to the west, and the, the kind of uh, top brass comes down on him and says, just do what you're damn well told. Uh, and, of course, he's an American. No, no, I know he's a Viking, but he's a kind of American Viking. Uh, and, of course, that means he won't do as he's told. Uh, and also, of course, he, uh, he, uh, he missed his hopes on kind of technological innovation that he gets somebody to build him the kind of ocean-going uh, longship. And he also says at one point, if I remember rightly, uh, uh, I'm not going to do this unless we're all equal. Um, 
Yes. Well, that is a very American concept, and I think would have gone down like a lead balloon in kind of uh, Scandinavian society. What do you mean equal? I'm putting the money up. I built the boat. Do as you're damn well told. Would be more like it, I think. Uh, but there's that sort of um, uh, urge to uh, to uh, make it suitable for a modern audience. Um, fair enough. And the other thing I thought is that um, uh, the Viking era, after all, was kind of 250 years long. Um, yeah, a bit more than that, actually. Um, 789 to 1066, call it, call it 270, 280 years. And it goes through phases, doesn't it? Um, the first phase is loot. Um, but actually, once you've looted uh, uh, all the churches and monasteries you can think of, uh, that's a non-renewable resource. So what are you going to do next? Uh, I know, slaves. We can always find a market for slaves. True, we've got to ship them. It's a, and we've got to find a market for them. OK, I know what we'll do. We'll take over land. Yes, let's take over land and colonize. And then you get into kind of Game of Thrones, when actually you have people attempting to become king of England, say. Um, well, those are all quite clear phases in, uh, in the kind of Viking development. But the Vikings TV series compresses them. They, they all come very hard on the heels of each other. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one minute Rollo is, uh, is getting set to launch his Viking raids on, on Normandy. And next he's taking French lessons and having his hair cut. Um, so it all goes, things which surely took like, kind of like three generations are sort of pushed into, an, into one lifetime. Um, but again, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's fair enough because you've only got so much time to tell the story and you're going to have to compress it, aren't you? Um, so on the whole, I thought, uh, and I'll tell you, every now and then as I was watching it, I think, you know, those guys know something. Uh, one that struck me forcibly is the uh, rather redundant wife of, is it Rollo, who's called... Lathgerth. And I looked at her and I thought, you know, that's Saxo Grammaticus, Lathgertha. Yeah. And then yeah, I thought Gertha. further and I thought, yeah, but actually Lathgertha, surely that is the family divinity of the Jarls of Lathier and that Thorgather, and that she was perhaps originally Hlatha Gather, in other words, Gather of Lathier. Right, but yeah. in Danish, that oh, like there, like in, like in Forest Gear, like and then the you, there you are, you've got Lathgertha. Um, so, uh, um, I thought, uh, um, the script writers cast their net widely and they came up with things which you might not have uh, expected, and it would take quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of sorting out. But then, you know, some time ago, I was asked to write a piece about uh, um, the um the uh, uh, the, uh, the use of, uh, of Scandinavian mythology and modern fantasy. And uh, I said, quick as a flash, I can't do it. Um, I can't do it. It's not possible. It's gone viral. Um, it, that's exactly right. It's gone viral. Uh, the, 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 the script writers and so on, and the people who write popular novels, they don't know where they get things from anymore. Um, there have been so many books and so many uh, uh, artistic works and so on. You just have no idea. You couldn't trace the history of it all. Um, Wikipedia. Well, you could actually, but it would be a, 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 a terribly, it'd be, you'd have to have six PhD students all working on separate corners to put all that together. And even then you'd miss something, I'm sure. So um, somebody apply for I don't the think I could actually figure out what the script writers of the Viking series were getting their ideas from. And I don't think they could either. Do you know how many um, issues of the Thor magazine were put out by Marvel Comics? No, but well, quite a lot. I don't really know what he was growing up, so it's a lot. <laughs> More than 600, and I, I have never read one of them. Um, well, actually, I did look at the kind of summaries in, uh, in one of the indexes, uh, but uh, uh, that really is more information than I can shake a stick at. Uh, and and I don't think even the script writers could tell me what, where they got the ideas from. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, the, the interest in Vikings is very widespread and has been fed by many, many uh, 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 rewriters and commentators. Um, and it's now become, I would say, better known. Norse myth is better known than classical myth and probably than biblical myth. Um, don't know 
how to test that, but that's that's my feeling. Uh, it's really been a you know started from scratch as well. Um, whole thing was completely forgotten for centuries, and then it came back again. <clears throat> that's because it's good stuff. And I think your your book does a good job of showing that that, and also a good a good job of showing how that that interest um, is not always um, attended by the likes of. I use the word us loosely, but attended by the likes of us as well as as we might. Um, mm -hmm. That comes across quite quite strongly. Mm -hmm. Jules wondering, but I think you actually make a comment on this or uh, in the book. But uh, could it be that writing sagas rather than during the long nights in winter could be the long um, could be the long summer days in Iceland? Yeah, so well. Could be. Uh, um, uh, I've only been to Iceland once, and um, I was struck by what a kind of marginal habitat it is. Uh, um, you know, I was looking at the their their, their occasional fields of uh, barley and stuff, and, and I've lived in Scotland. You know, I'm used to poor soil and and poor returns, but Iceland. I, I looked at. It, I thought that looks to me like crop failure, actually. Um, so I, I would have thought that probably in the in the long days of summer, um, certainly a, a preoccupation is is haymaking. You've got to make as much hay as you can while you can, because you need to stock as much as you can to feed your beasts over the winter. Because if they die over the winter, you're you're bust when the spring comes. So I think uh, I think uh, uh, being an Icelandic farmer probably didn't leave you a lot of spare time. Uh, uh, during the summer, but in the winter, on the other hand, you've got to do it all, you know, by the light of a candle, and candles are expensive. Uh, um, it's a, it's it's an amazing achievement actually to produce that outpouring of uh, sagas and poems um, uh, in such terrible circumstances. Um, it's uh, it's astonishing. Um, when you think of someone like Snorri Sturluson and the the amount he actually wrote, you know, with a handwritten with a pen, you've got to dip in an inkwell on sheepskin. Um, uh, as I say, probably, uh, probably uh, in the dark nights when you've only got a candle, and he didn't have index cards and he couldn't look things up on the internet. It, it's astonishing he got anything done at all. They must have had really good memories to uh, to cope with all that. So I, and he must have I mean, really I wanted say, to do it. <laughs> yeah, I must have cared a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a very good book by another Icelander, Gisli Sigurdsson, about um, uh, the medieval saga and oral tradition. And he points out that uh, that uh, Iceland uh, has still got a very strong oral tradition um, of uh, passing things on, including genealogies. Um, uh, you, you probably noticed, you know, you, a couple of Icelanders meet each other and you, you have to go away and amuse yourself for 10 minutes while they're just checking up on who their families are to see if they're related, because they often are. But they know who their third cousins are and they know who their third cousin's uh, no, father's second wife was. Uh, and uh, they're, they're always trying to work that out. And I have met, I met a young woman not long ago who was dead certain. She was a direct descendant of Egil Skattergrimsson. And I think probably she was. Um, they're very keen on genealogy and they do have a kind of trained memory for getting that kind of thing right. You look at a penguin saga translation, every time a character's brought in, there's a footnote at the bottom saying he's a son of the son of the son of the son of. And we think, oh, I'm not going to look at that. Um, but actually, you need to know that stuff. Um, some of it's going to come in, come in and be important later. Uh, you've got to have all that in your head. But our heads don't work that way anymore. Maybe one last question here coming in uh, from Jen. Uh, she's just asking if um, uh, the some of the more ironic, morbid, slapstick humor crowded out other kinds of humor in this culture. Are there other funny, witty elements that are, are characteristic as well? Or is it? Uh, figure out the the principles of um, of uh, northern humour is uh, is quite difficult. Um, 
because a lot of it is deadpan stuff. Um, you know, people say things to you, and uh, and even now uh, they say things to you to see if you get it. Um, and sometimes you may not be sure how to take it. Um, I remember my father saying to me once when I was complaining about something or other, he said, a little bit of pain never hurt anyone. Now, that's nonsense, isn't it? Pain hurts. That is the sort of definition of pain and of hurt. So what he was saying was nonsense. Um, but I knew what he meant. Um, and that kind of double meaning uh, comment, I think, is uh, is very characteristic. Uh, I can't think of a, 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 a one line example offhand, but one scene I thought was very striking was at the end of a chapter of Grettir's saga. Grettir is talking to his uncle Jukul, and uh, uncle Jukul says to Grettir something along the lines of, uh, Gretir, you are pushing your luck. Uh, you had better stop doing that kind of thing. And Gretir, who isn't very good at taking advice, says to his uncle Yuko something like, and it would be a good idea for you to consider your career options. Um, and they're both, in a way, each, each man is warning the other very, very sort of uh, in, a, in a very elliptical way. And in fact, each man is right. Jukul is going to get killed and Gretir is going to get killed because neither of them took the other's advice. Now, that's the kind of ironic scene they like. You know, um, you've got two guys here. Each can see the danger hanging over the other's head. And each is blind to the danger hanging over his own head. That's kind of, kind of double dramatic irony. And I think uh, that sort of um, uh, compressed hint uh, is it, it's, it's elliptic language combined with, with uh, serious understatement and a kind of deadpan delivery. Um, and uh, actually, it's your job to decode it. And if you can't decode it, bad luck. Um, Another one I can think of is when um, St. Olaf is whittling a stick on a Sunday, just whittling a stick, and his Skolsvein, his page, says to him, Lord, tomorrow will be Monday. Right, what does that mean? It means tomorrow will be Monday. Uh, yeah, I know that. Why is he telling me this? Uh, what he means is today is Sunday. Yeah, I know that. Why is he telling me today is Sunday? Ah, I've got it. Because I am infringing the commandment, thou shalt keep the, the, the Sabbath day holy. And I'm infringing the commandment because I'm working on a Sunday. I'm whittling a stick. So that's a, a warning. Well, actually, it's not a warning. It's a criticism. But you have to drop two levels to get to the criticism. And of course, what St. Olaf does is he, he appreciates the comment and he takes his pile of uh, of, of kindling and burns it on his open palm as a penance because he has infringed the commandment. So uh, that that sort of uh, uh, yeah, that's the way they talk. And actually, that's that's uh, that's the book that I might write. I might write or I might not write. It depends if I'm spared. But I've got about a th half of it drafted, and it's called How the Heroes Talk. And the short answer is. Not much. <laughs> yeah, well, is so that going to be a short book? I can, or I can, I can work that out. <laughs> <laughs> of course, not much is going to make for a rather short book, isn't it? I have to <laughs> <add that on. laughs> Chapter one, not much. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, that can be the review. I don't know if I, I might have missed some questions in there, but I, I think that's most of them, at least. Um, so, uh, well, Nelson, let me say, if, if, if anyone wants to send me on a question, uh, you know, my email address is dead easy. It should be at slu.edu, slu for St. Louis University dot edu. So if you have a question we haven't dealt with, just send it to me and I'll do my best to answer it. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. This has been a, a really good. I've enjoyed this hour and a half. I think people have too. <laughs> I, uh, if you haven't read the book, I really do recommend it. It's 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 absolutely worth it. Um, and hopefully, if you if you're in any doubt of that, hopefully you won't be in any doubt of that after. <laughs> after you'll today. laugh. You'll cry. You'll and laughing shall you die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks uh, all, so, Carl. Thank you, Tom. Awesome. Thank Nelson, I've got to send you some stuff uh, in, in a little while. I've been following your Germanic philology lectures. Uh, and I, there's some things I'm going to, going to ask you about or tell you about. Um, and Carl, nice to see you. Um, and uh, uh, we'll be in touch as well. Yeah. And I, I'll catch up with Paul too uh, once he's well. He's up off teaching now, but I'll catch up with him later. And thanks also to our audience for, uh, for listening in. And we hope you enjoyed it too. Okay. Well, well. thanks. Well, good night, all. Thank you. Well, bye.